Hi. This is a terrific event. I'm so pleased to be invited. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm going to tell you a story today. Um, in December, I quit my job as the editor of Wired, which I'd done for 12 years. I quit my job to run a Tijuana drone factory. Tijuana drone factory, just let you sort of run that, run that over through your head. Um, and it's kind of an odd, strange path that got me there. But what it fundamentally is about is that I discovered, almost by accident, that Mexico is the new China and that our southern neighbor is possibly the secret to an American manufacturing renaissance. And I live in Berkeley and I don't speak Spanish and I'd only known of Mexico as beach vacations and terrifying headlines before then. And now I run a Tijuana drone factory. And the story of how I came to this realization is surprising and maybe exactly the right way that we should learn about things. But it starts with, um, with Lego. Uh, this is, um, I have five children. Um, we live up in the Berkeley Hills. Um, they go to school here, and this is my daughter Erin. She's nine. Um, was nine in this picture. I'm always trying to get them interested in science and technology, and just failing and failing and failing again. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm possibly because I'm trying too hard. Almost certainly because I'm trying too hard. Um, but um, I started a site called Geek Dad, which is all about doing cool science and technology projects with my children. And now they not only won't go to the site, but also when I do those projects with them, they say, you're not doing this for Geek Dad, are you? I was like, oh, just like it ruined that. Um, so that didn't work. But one weekend, um, about five years ago, um, at Wired, we were given the, these two boxes came in for review. One of them was a um, new Leg Lego Mindstorms NXT kit, just come out, Lego Robotics. And the other was this radio control airplane. And I thought, this is going to be great. This is going to be the best Geek Dad ever, Geek Dad weekend ever. On Saturday, we're going to build a robot, and on Sunday, we're going to fly a plane. This is going to be the weekend. We finally crack the nut. We get them interested in science and technology. So the first job is to, on Saturday, was with Lego, was to build the Lego robot. And Aaron is now building the Tribot, which is you know, dutifully following the instructions. You put it together. It takes quite a while. And then you program it. And here's Daniel. Um, and this is, you know, we have spent the morning programming it, and it's now going to go. And what happens, this is what happens when you build the Tribot and program it and correctly, by the way, it's worse if you don't, and, and you press go, it, it, it moves forward at a relatively slow pace until it hits a wall and then it backs away. Now, my children have seen Transformers. <laughs> they're aware <laughs> that robots are supposed to do more than that, and they're like, you've got to be kidding, right? We spent all morning. Where are the lasers? Where are the rockets? You know, why is humanity not enslaved? And, <laughs> and, you know, it's just really hard to compete with Hollywood on robotics. CG is really cool, and it uh, can't do that in the real world. So that kind of sucked. But then there was Sunday. We were going to fly a plane. It was, look, the plane looked like this. And we went to the park. We watched YouTube videos of people doing acrobatics. And, you know, it was outside, and it involved machinery, and fast-moving targets in the air, and, and it ended up like that. <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't embarrassing enough that I, I suck as a pilot, and I flew it into a tree, but the, the fact that I would retrieve it, the fact that I would climb the tree and, and retrieve the plane was just incredibly mortifying to the children, and uh, required, required um, ice cream, deployment of ice cream afterwards. As, as a bribe, and it pretty much confirmed their, their, their sort of, at this point now, sort of well-experienced prejudice that, you know, science and technology projects with your dad will end up with disappointment and failure. <laughs> Which, to be fair, was, was, was pretty accurate. Um, so I was kind of annoyed at, well, them, but also a little at myself for having to, once again, you know, not catalyze, not sort of sparked that moment in my kids of loving what I loved and, you know, seeing the magic of things all around us and, uh. So I went for a run and I thought, how could that have gone better? 
And I thought, well, you know what? The problem was this. The problem was the Lego was not as impressive as I'd hoped. It's really hard to do things that will blow a kid's mind. Kids are, kids are like hard to impress these days. Video games. Um, and, and um, you know, so it was, so it was something that was more interesting with Lego and something that involved a plane that wouldn't have involved crashing into a tree. And I thought, well, what if the Lego had flown the plane? What if we had built a Lego flying robot? So I came back from the run, and I was like, kids, one last project. <laughs> Gather around, children. <laughs> and on the dining room table, we made the world's first Lego autopilot. So there it is. That's, that's okay, I know, it's, it's only Lego. But, you know, I mean, I, th that ha it turns out that Lego had includes kind of cool stuff these days. Um, those sensors, it has accelerometers and gyroscopes and compass sensors and GPS that can connect to, uh, sorry, Bluetooth that can connect to GPS. And, and I kind of Googled autopilot and sort of had some rough, rough understanding of what would be required. And we put it together and it put it in a plane and it kind of almost worked. It, it did fly. Um, and it didn't end up in a tree. Um, it did not, in fact, interest my children, <laughs> but it was, it was kind of freaky. And, and this is the world's first Lego unmanned aerial vehicle, which is now in the Lego Museum in Billund, Denmark. I'll have you know. It's probably a lot safer than in the air. But, <laughs> um, I, and, and again, the kids lost interest, but I went down the rabbit hole. And I thought, how is it possible that we can make a, a, a Lego UAV, a, a Lego-powered drone, on the kitchen table with my children? I thought this was hard. I thought this was like aerospace stuff. And I started Googling around, and it turns out, by the way, that um, uh, autopilots are, are, are regulated um, by export control, Department of Commerce and, and State Department, as military technologies, um, and export controlled under something called ITAR, and that uh, technically they're considered, considered cruise missile controllers. And the act of exporting it, including putting the plans on the internet, which we did, um, is uh, considered a violation of export control, and technically we weaponized Lego. <laughs> which... I thought would have made, as the editor of Wired, I thought that would be a good story. <laughs> I can't wait till they call me in for the congressional hearing to explain how this could have happened. You know, once you export these things, you need to put them under a 24-hour closed-circuit surveillance and have a check-in, check-out log to make sure that nobody, uh, no foreign national, might have access to this military-industrial technology. Um, again, you're referring, yeah, that, it's that. So it occurred to me that something had changed. If it is possible for you know, a, a clueless dad and his children to build a cruise missile controller on the dining room table with Lego, then something in this world has changed. And it turns out that, uh, later discovered this, that what had, what had changed is that the smartphone revolution, this, this is we so-called magic in your pocket, now the other magic in your pocket, um, <laughs> is, has, created a suite of technologies that are unbelievably powerful. These are sensors and, you know, these kind of MEM sensors, these microelectronic mechanical device sensors, but basically the, that gyros and accelerometers and all these awesome things are now a chip, you know, a all in, a single chip that you have GPS and cameras and ARM core processors and wireless and batteries and all this other awesome stuff in the smartphone, that's driving the smartphone revolution is also making components that are available to everybody else to make other things, be it robotics or the Internet of Things or quantified self devices and health monitoring and all this stuff. And it is, it is Moore's law has never moved faster than it's moving in your pocket. Um, and I'll, I'll stop that metaphor right there. But um, <laughs> the, point, the point only is that's why it was possible, that these things used to be hard and they'd suddenly gotten easy thanks to the apples of the androids in the world. But I didn't know that then. All I knew is that my children and I had weaponized Lego on the dining room table and that that was a moment. That was one of those kind of, you know, you get chills. You're like, something interesting just happened. I don't know what it is. I'm going to find out. And, and the, way I, the way I tend to find out is, is um, the, the, uh, I have this, 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 this practice, this, this philosophy, and the philosophy is be stupid in public. Um, the nice thing about being stupid in public, and by the way, by stupid in public, I mean I created, created a website called DIY Drones, and I started... It was a community, and I started asking dumb questions. And the great thing about being stupid in public is that it does two things. First of all, people help you get smarter. They answer your dumb questions. And second of all, it liberates other people to be, quote unquote, stupid in public. And it turns out that a lot of other people were noticing the same thing I was at that time, which was that sensors 
had become really cheap and really powerful, and you could do amazing things with them. But, but we didn't have PhDs in aerospace engineering and robotics and computer science, etc. We were just regular people who had Lego and could went to Radio Shack and were playing with Arduino. And we recognized we had powerful tools with our, in our disposal, at our disposal, but we didn't know how to put them together in, the, in these ways that was sort of you know, professional knowledge in the aerospace industry and professional knowledge in academics, but nothing we knew anything about. So we sat, a bunch of us went online, and we started Googling things like common filter and sensor fusion, and, and we started sharing this information, and we started making these things and sharing design files and trading code, and we started making drones. And, you know, small, peaceful, harmless, fuzzy pet drones, but drones all the same. Um, aut fully autonomous flying robots, automatic takeoff, landing, GPS, waypoints, camera controls, the works, and for like hundreds of dollars, not hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you know, kind of turning toys into flying robots, and it was just kind of amazing this was possible. And um, as, as this grew, and I, people kind of came together and started building this open source kind of robotics project, they, people started saying, well, could you make them for us, for us? Can we just buy them, please? And we thought, well, I thought, well, I should probably start a company. And, um, and I met this guy. Um, this is the cover of Make Magazine, which is kind of the Bible, the maker movement of which we're part. And, and the picture there is, 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 is one of the guys who was on the site. One of the first guys who was on the site. His name is Jordi Munoz. And he immediately got everyone's attention because he did this wonderful thing. He posted a YouTube video of him flying a helicopter with a Wii controller. Now, this was about five years ago, and at the time, it was kind of amazing. You know, first of all, A, he hacked the Wii controller, B, he'd hacked it with, and he didn't connect it to something called Arduino, which is an open source robot, you know, computing program, uh, platform, rather. And he'd put it on a helicopter, and it kind of almost worked. And he posted code and explained what he was doing, and he was just unbelievably smart, and he seemed like the guy to know. And so I said, Jordy, um, that's awesome. Do you want to do some of these projects together? And we worked on a blimp, and then we worked on a little autopilot. And I said, Jordy, clearly this community wants to just buy these things. So some of them would like to make them, but others would just like to buy them. You want to start a company? And he said, okay. And I said, tell me a bit about yourself. I hadn't met him. And it turns out that uh, when Jordy had first posted that video, he was a 19-year-old high school graduate living in Tijuana. And by the time we started a company, he was 21, and he just moved from Tijuana, and he still hadn't been to college, still hasn't been to college, and um, it didn't matter. Uh, the point was, he'd already proven that he was the smartest guy in the world at this stuff, and he was available, and he had full of energy, and it was a little hobby for me, it was a side project. You know, I didn't think much of it. He was gonna do the work, he seemed super smart, he was super excited, the community would be served, products would exist, all good. I had a day job. And so, and so we, we, this is what we did. We were amateurs. We're hobbyists. We're just doing this stuff by fun, you know, in, in the evenings and nights. So my children were, became our, the, you know, 3D Robotics North factory. <laughs> we're assembling um, a robot blimp here, um, Lego parts, Arduino, a couple printed circuit boards. Um, a couple lessons from this particular assembly line, um, which Number one, it's perfectly okay to pay the workers with strawberries and juice, <laughs> um, as, as long as you don't tell them, oops, wait, sorry, <laughs> oh, that's out of the bag. Um, the second is that do not put the six-year-old on quality control. <laughs> um, uh, it doesn't end well, she doesn't do a good job, and the customers are remarkably unsympathetic about why their kid is missing parts. <laughs> it's because a six-year-old did it. <laughs> Come on. Anyway, so that was 3D Robotics North, and this was 3D Robotics, oh, this, this is what we made, these are these blimp kits, we put them in pizza boxes as one does, and shipped them out. This is a big day, shipping, right? How it goes. Goes down to the post office. Um, 3D Robotics South was this. This is Jordy, this is 2010. Um, uh, this is Jordy in a uh, little garage, and he's hand, hand soldering the boards. And this is pretty much the way I thought it was gonna go. Um, I was going to, you know, whenever the orders come in, I would rally the troops, bring out the strawberries and juice, and we would, you know, we would, uh, you know, spin up the assembly line at 3D Robotics uh, North, and whenever the orders came in, Jordy would 
pulled out the soldering iron and soldered the boards and threw the robotic south. And that was pretty much the end of it, I thought. Um, and they sent me another picture. They said, we've got a space. And uh, he says, there's some people working with me now. And this is uh, Lorenzo, and um, that's Arturo in the back. And, we, and I, the first thing I noticed is we had shelves. I, I didn't know we had shelves. And then he said, oh, and by the way, that woman on the right, Rebecca, she's our bookkeeper. And I'm like, we have a bookkeeper. <laughs> and in the back, um, there's no soldering iron anymore because now he said, oh, and by the way, we bought a pick-and-place machine on eBay. Now, a pick-and-place machine is, and by the way, I had to Google this after he told me this, um, a pick-and-place machine is a, um, um, a manufacturing robot that basically has this, that takes these little chips and puts them on board really fast and sort of does it faster and more precisely than a human can do, and it just puts the board, and then it goes into a reflow oven, and then it melts the solder, and out of this comes a professional printed circuit board, and he bought it on eBay, and it was used, and he downloaded the manual from Google, and I was like, huh, I may have picked the right partner here. So then, so then that, was, that, was, that was one picture, and then he sent me another picture, and it looked like that. <laughs> Jordy's now 23, I believe, at this point. Um, so these are now, this is now like our third pick-and-place line, and much bigger pick-and-places, and stencil printers, and reflow ovens, and now we have CNC machines, and a whole QA department, not six-year-olds, but like professionals, and shipping departments, and... And, 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 you know, I, I, finally I had to go down there and see it. And the thing that really impressed me was that in the shipping department, all those foam peanuts, there was this big dispenser hanging from the ceiling. They'd just, like, pull this cord, and the foam peanuts would fill the box. And I was like, whoa. it's <laughs> a pro move. <laughs> and, and then he sent me a picture of the newest acquisition, which was a forklift. And the day your company has a forklift is the day you've got a real company. <laughs> and, so, and so then I, I decided, I'd been talking to some venture capitalists, and I said, you know what? I think we're actually ready. Um, you know, we have, Jordy had built a real company, and um, today, this is, uh, then we opened up a second factory, and this one's in Tijuana. This is just a picture of our clean room uh, down there in Tijuana. And, and, and these are now our San Diego and Tijuana operations, um, three years after the kitchen table with the juice and the strawberries and the Lego. And I just wanted to sort of finish this story by saying that this is what I learned from meeting Jordi Munoz on the internet. This is what 21-year-olds from Tijuana know that I didn't know. First of all, this is what 21-year-olds know. They have these animal instincts for technology. They just, he, he turned me on to Arduino, he turned me on to these sensors, and he just did it. And he was, he was exactly right. And I was the editor-in-chief of Wired, and he was this, you know, high school graduate in Tijuana, and everything I knew about drones, I ended up learning from him. The second thing that I learned from him is that regular people can build factories. You know, he went on eBay and bought a pick-and-place machine, and then he just did it. He just went out and, you know, Googled stuff and found the manufacturers and called them and just bought this stuff and built a factory, and he did it in two years. And the third thing I learned from Jordy is that Tijuana is, is the new China. I had thought that it was drug cartels and cheap tequila and, you know, and you know you've read the headlines. But then, but this, what Tijuana natives know is that in the 20 years since NAFTA, Something amazing has happened. This has gone from cheap labor to high-skilled labor. Tijuana, all these flat-screen televisions, check the back of your TV. It says, made in Mexico, it was made in Tijuana. That's where the Samsungs and the Foxconns and the Sonys are. In those 20 years, they have been moving up the value chain, and they've been learning. If today, if you want to hire people who work for global, world-class multinationals like Samsung in North America, you're going to do it in Mexico. They're not here in the United States anymore. They're in Mexico, and they're good, and they're fast. And Mexico graduates 115,000 engineers per year. That's more than the United States. There are two million people in Tijuana, twice the size of San Diego. These are incredibly skilled manufacturing workers, and they are in the NAFTA zone. So when we think about the future of manufacturing, and we think about insourcing, and 
finding a, man, a many, uh, American manufacturing future that can compete with China? The answer is it's not United States, it's North America. We have, I spent four years living in China, in Guangdong, Dongguan, Hong Kong, and I saw the Hong Kong Shenzhen nexus, and I saw how powerful that was. And what a 21-year-old from Tijuana knows is that San Diego is a Hong Kong, and Tijuana is the Shenzhen, and we have, we have the skills right here in North America to compete with anybody in the world. And three years ago, I thought it was a place to go for vacation. Now, I run a factory there. Jordi changed my life, opened my eyes to what's going on here, and maybe this is a path that may change the future of the country. Thank you very much.